Good day, everyone. My name is Ju Ling Shi from National Central University, Taiwan. It is my best honor to introduce Professor Nai Shang Ye, Professor of Physics at California Institute of Technology, Caltech. Her principal research field is experimental condensed matter physics with special emphasis on quantum materials and nanoscience. Her research group currently engaged in studies of the science and technology of correlated electrons, topological materials, low dimensional systems, volitronics, spintronics, optoelectronics, nanophotonics, nanoscience and technology, and nanotechnology, energy research, and precise measurements using superconducting technology. To date, she has over 150 papers published in scientific Fine. journals and has been awarded four patents. Professor Ye is an alumni of National, uh, National Taiwan University and MIT. She is the first tenure woman professor in physics and also the first tenure Asian woman professor at Caltech. Her professional honors are over a dozen and I can only name a few that include Distinguished Visiting Professor of Shanghai University, China, Achievement Award Xin Excellence in Educational program, Education Program of Tsinghua University, China, Visiting Chair Professor at National Central University, Taiwan. A few years back, BBC World News featured her research in one of the Horizon episode Abundant World. Professor Ye has also served on many national and international committee and, prof and professional activities. Some of her recent roles include Advisory Committee on International Science and Engineering, Committee on Equal Opportunities in Science and Engineering in U.S. Science, a National Science Foundation. She's also Academic Advisory Committee of Institute of Physics Academic Sinica Taiwan, an advisory panel of Sunlight for Everything, Rasnik Institute for Energy and Sustainability of Caltech, and many more in a long list. <laughs> Having that said, we cannot wait to know more about the details of Professor Ye's work. Without further ado, let's welcome Professor Ye to give her talk on a perspective of modern frontiers in nanoscience and nanotechnology. Professor Ye. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction. So let me try to, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully I can get to the, uh, can, I can, I'm trying to share now. Okay, let's see. Yeah, so can you see my screen now? Yes, it's coming up. Very nice. Yes. Okay. So now I can make it a full screen. All right. <laughs> so much. So so much for the high technology. <laughs> okay. Well. Uh, yeah. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so today I'm going to describe a little bit about um, some um, a perspective of modern frontiers in nanoscience and nanotechnology. This is a very highly interdisciplinary topics, and it requires actually a lot of principles require quantum mechanics. But I will try to keep things as simple as I can. Um, so I will first start by talking about um, the scope and impact of nanoscience and nanotechnology. It's actually in our daily life. Uh, then I will describe. Um, uh, some key nanofabrication technologies and imaging technologies for uh, nanostructures. And I will talk about um, modern nano instrumentation that are capable of doing characterizations uh, using scanning probe microscopy. And then, then also uh, some interesting nanomaterials and nano devices, uh, and also applications of nanoscience and technology to various uh, frontier technologies and research. And then finally, I'll summarize and, and talk about the outlook. Uh, before I start, let me just mention that one nanometer means 10 to the minus nine meters. Okay, so give you a brief history. Actually, um, it's arguably uh, Professor Richard Feynman should be the um, basically the, the first person to talk about the concept of nanoscience and nanotechnology. Uh, it was in December 1959, he gave us 
uh, a talk at Caltech. Um, and the title is, There is Plenty of Room at the Bottom. And so these are um, quotes from what he said. And it was amazing that at the time, nobody was thinking about nanoscience and technology. But he said the following. He said, I would like to describe a field in which little has been done, but in which an enormous amount can be done in principle. It might tell us much of great interest about strange phenomena that occur in complex situations. It would have an enormous uh, number of technical applications. What I want to talk about is the problem of manipulating and controlling things on a small scale. There is room. You can decrease the size of things in Thanks. a practical way. And we now, uh, I now want to show that there is plenty of room according to the laws of physics. And today, uh, everybody knows that nanoscience and nanotechnology has become a major multidisciplinary research field uh, with important impacts ranging from fundamental science to technologies for space, communicate, uh, computation, information and communications, consumer electronics, energy, sustainability, medicine, etc. Um, so, so actually, uh, Byman's 1959 challenge um, already got answered about a couple of decades uh, later. Uh, in 1959, he, he gave this talk and then he challenged people. He said that um, in the future, people could, should be able to write the entire Encyclopedia Botanica on the head of a pin. And this is a task and he estimated would need um, structures of dots of like a nanometer in size. But that's no problem these days. Uh, so Feynman actually had that challenge to people. And actually in 1980s, later on, with the invention of modern scanning probe microscopy, the first invention was um, scanning tunneling microscopy and then atomic force microscopy. All of these things can allow us to manipulate individual atoms uh, and create computer chips with integrated devices down to just a few nanometers in dimension. So this is an, a, a schematic image showing scanning tunneling microscopy. I'll get to that later. Um, so nanoscience research has the, um, actually is uh, multidisciplinary. And uh, what, what do we do in nanoscience? Uh, we try to understand the physical and chemical principles down to atomic and molecular scales. One nanometer is just crossing between atomic and molecular scales. So that's what we can do. Um, and, and so people use nanoscience to investigate phenomena at those um, dimensions. And then you can also design and manipulate atomic molecular scale physical chemical characteristics and processes. And then uh, one can develop and fabricate functional nanomaterials, nanometamaterials, which I will explain, and nano devices. And they have a huge impact on modern life. And then we can also correlate um, the nanoscale characteristics uh, with microscopic phenomena of systems after you integrate them. Um, and so, so these are some pictures showing some atoms of graphene, some nanocrystals. These are nano, nano fabrication uh, arrays, and this is uh, some nano device. Um, I will elaborate a little bit more. And so there are many, many technical applications. I won't go through the entire list, but just to a minimum level, what's impacting us every day. Your computers, in your computers, in your cell phones, uh, and also a lot of things that wireless applications all these things require high density miniaturized devices and data storage. Uh, and also, if you want to think about you know, uh, ultra sensitive detectors from medicine to defense, uh, astronomy research space, exploration, communications, Internet of Things, quantum computation, quantum information technology, um, and, and the many, many things are also things down to nanoscales. The mechanical properties are totally different. You think about energy research, photovoltaics, energy generation, energy storage, carbon sequestration, um, all kinds of things. And also down to like metrology, uh, bioengineering, medicine, all of these uh, actually can have, have, have been impacted tremendously by nanoscience and nanotechnology. Um, it's highly interdisciplinary in nature. And, and then, so here I want to talk about what kind of disciplines are involved. So, so you, you cannot be an expert in everything, but if you are in one of these or a few of these things, you can do great in nanoscience and nanotechnology. So it includes physics, chemistry, biology, surface science, material science, 
neuroscience, I will also give two examples of that, electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, computer science, etc. And uh, the technical requirements generally for nanoscience, uh, nanoscale research is that we make, um, you want to do nanoscale fabrication, uh, imaging, and characterizations. Uh, so you make nanoscale instrumentation as well. And there are interesting nanomaterials and nano devices that you can fabricate. And then you want to be able to integrate and functionalize all kinds of nano systems. So let's move on to uh, nanofabrication technologies and imaging microscopy. So that, that, that's, so let me go back. Um, so I will first talk about nano, nanoscale fabrication and then nano instrumentation characterizations and all these topics. Um, okay, so nanofabrication technology and imaging microscopy. Generally, if we are dealing with inorganic materials and let's first think about the top-down nanoscale fabrication and microscopy. Uh, sorry. And so um, generally there are three categories, uh, photolithography, electron beam lithography and microscopy, and focus ion beam lithography and microscopy. All of these you will find that even though you use light for photolithography, you use electron beam for electron beam lithography, you use ion beam for ion uh, beam lithography. All of these, they, you talk about the optics, the design of the optics. So what's going on? And that's because quantum mechanically, we have particle wave duality. So particles are waves, waves are particles. You can think of it that way. So, it, so if light consists of photons, so they are like particles, but light is also, you can think of light as waves. And similarly, our particle wave duality in quantum mechanics um, is fully realized in these designs of microscopy. So the first thing which has a huge impact on modern nanoelectronics is photolithography. So I will um, talk about this first. It's the primary technology for fabrications of modern nano devices. All of your computer chips, all those um, devices uh, for in commercial applications are primarily based on photolithography. So the idea is that you take some kind of laser beam and you, um, you take a substrate. This substrate consists of um, uh, light sensitive polymers. So you use the, the laser beam to write on the polymer and then the part that's written by the, the light can be developed. That means you can remove that and then you can, and underneath you have a, a chromium system. So when you develop this process, you can remove actually the chromium according to how you write it using your light. And then you can remove the polymer and etch off these um, processes, uh, so you have the pattern transfer to the chromium. Then you take this chromium transfer pieces, and here I just showed lines, but in reality, it can be a very complicated circuit. And then you can put it under, uh, under ultraviolet light, and then you use lenses to focus this thing and reduce this dimension further. Laser, you can write things to very small dimension, and then you further use a lens optical lens to reduce it down to even smaller structures. And you can repeatedly develop this on another um, light sensitive uh, polymer. And then, uh, so you can transfer the pattern and you can have multiple patterns. Um, and so you can mass produce these patterns. And then later on, you can remove the polymer and then you actually have have the circuits that's uh, developed according to what you want. So, so a more sort of um, schematic, um, more sort of a systematic way of explaining this to you is that think about this. This is the side view. So I have a sample. I have a substrate. Um, so I cover my sample with something called photoresist that can protect the sample. And then um, I just mentioned that here we we can have a mask that's. Just I explain how we make the mask. So I put the mask upside down um, like this, and then then I can shine UV light through it. I can develop. So this yellow region is uh, so here is chromium. This is a side view. I have glass and chromium. So this was the um, sub uh, the the mask I just produced, uh, and then the substrate can be your sample can be your silicon wafer that you want. So you process uh, develop light, and then. Um, so this, this yellow region is also polymer. So this polymer can be developed and then you can then remove the polymer part that's developed. And then here, this pink area is still the photoresist. So your sample now is exposed and now you can do either wet or dry etching to remove the sample part that's not protected. And then finally you can strip the photoresist. And so basically you, you get a structure that's similar to your pattern, your mask. Okay, this is the mask. 
So you can transfer the pattern, but this is completely simplified. Um, so primarily, um, this is very cost effective. And so it's, it's the most um, commercially uh, friendly uh, processes. Um, and you have precise control of the shape and size. But there are problems with this kind of um, lithography because it requires very flat surface and you, um, and also um, it's hard to create non-flat features. And then also you need extremely clean conditions. That's why you need very, very good clean rooms. And also the resolution ultimately is limited by the UV light. Um, so generally the resolution, how small you can make it, like in TSMC, they, they, they are leading the world in making the smallest structures. Um, so usually the critical dimension that you can make is proportional to the wavelengths of the light that you use, and then also the um, numerical aperture. So you want to make a small dimension, as small as possible, you need to reduce, to reduce the light wavelengths and you can increase the numerical aperture. And currently, um, you, um, the modern technology, you can really have deep UV light, extreme UV light to bring the structures down to small dimensions. Um, okay, and so, so, so that was for photolithography, but then for electron and ion beam lithography, that's very, it's similar, but also very different. Electrons and, and ions, they're particles. Um, well, I talk about particle wave duality, but um, so, so basically you want to make microscopy or fabrication techniques out of these. You need to have particle emission sources and you need to have column optics. So these are optics for particles. And then you have detectors for particles and, um, and also photons because the signal that you've received will be including both particles and, and lights. And then, and then you can simulate to, uh, your data to understand it. Um, I cannot go over the great details, but here is just a picture showing that, okay, there are three types of different sources for electron beam and focus ion beam. So electron beam, naturally you think about how to, uh, you create electrons as the source. So instead of light, now you have electrons. So what you do is you heat up this, um, uh, uh, um, an emission gun to very, very high temperatures and you will apply a positive voltage. And so um, at very high temperatures, electrons can be then forced out by the, and then get attracted by the positive voltage. Then you can do other things to refocus the electrons that come out. Um, that's one way. And then uh, for ion beams, you can use gallium ion beam. And the reason is that gallium is something that has very low melting temperatures. So you heat it up, then gallium will come become liquid, and then you actually use a negative voltage to extract the positive ions coming out. Um, so, so this is a, a zooming picture that the liquid, you, uh, you heat it up to a low temperature, it already forms a liquid, and the liquid can form a sharp tip. And then you can extract it by um, bias voltage, and then the, beam, the ions can come out. Now, another uh, intermediate thing is a helium neon ion beam. You go to periodic tables, you know helium, only has two uh, protons and a neon is uh, right below helium. And so they are very light um, elements, uh, unlike gallium, gallium is much heavier. And so in this case, you actually uh, apply a high voltage tip and you inject helium gas or neon gas. And then this high voltage tip will strip the electrons away from helium or neon ion uh, and form, and therefore helium and neon atoms become ions, and then you can use a negative voltage to extract them out. So these are how sources are prepared. And once these particles are extracted out, you use some kind of, um, uh, you, you use different techniques to focus the beams uh, into small dimensions. So in scanning electron microscopy, is called SEM, or focused ion beam microscopy is called FIB, um, electrons and ion beams respectively are focused to a, uh, into a small probe. Uh, you want to have high resolution. So you can image or you can fabricate small structures. Um, so if you have electrons, you use electromagnetic field to focus this beam. And if you have ions, you use electrostatic, uh, quote unquote, lenses to focus the beams as if they are optical lenses for photons. Um, but the principles are similar if you use um, particle wave duality is just the mechanisms to focus them is different. Okay, and so finally you have this probe and this probe, the probe 
size. Uh, so you have electrons or ions coming and then focus onto this probe, and then this is your sample. Um, and then these will be sensitive to the voltage that you apply and the current you apply, uh, the, the current of the particles you have, the angle, how you will in focus. And then there's a dimension of uh, the, probe, the, the probe diameter. So this probe diameter, you want it to be as small as possible so that you have better resolution. Quantum mechanical, you think about these massive particles. Uh, photons have no mass, but particles have masses. And there's something called de Broglie wavelengths. That's completely a quantum mechanical concept. This de Broglie wavelength says that your wavelength of particles is inversely proportional to the square root of the mass of the particle and the energy of it. And therefore, if you have, um, you, you want smaller uh, wavelengths in order to have better resolution. And so generally you will think that you have, uh, if you have higher energy particles, then you have better resolution. But, uh, or high masses, you have better resolution. But there are also issues when you have high masses because you can cause more damage. So, so you have to think about what you want to do. So, so for electron beam lithography, this is just um, uh, schematically showing, okay, you, you have the electrons that come out and you have some optics that are electromagnetic fields um, that behave like lenses in optics and then focus the beam. And then you can then, um, then project the, the, the um, signals out to some kind of screen or detector. Um, sorry, I just... Okay, um, now electron beam, so for instance, electron beam, what you can do if you want to develop patterns, uh, electron beam has very good resolution. So you put some resist on the electron beam, sorry, uh, just, and then uh, the, then you use laser to write on this, write very fine features on it, and you develop it and you uh, deposit same whatever metal you want, and then you can remove the polymer and then lift off. So then you get a structure that you want. So you can do it maskless lithography uh, using electron beam. Um, so there is a very good advantage that is you can have just a few nanometer resolution, very good resolution. But there are disadvantages because it's very slow, unlike the photolithography is good for mass production. Electron beam lithography is usually very slow. And so this is like one example at Caltech that we have this very nice, sorry, very nice um, combination of electron beam and gallium focus ion beam. This is what the outside looks like, uh, the outside another angle. Uh, these are all kept in clean room because we are doing very, very fine nanoscience, nanotechnology. And this is if you open up inside, there are all these different, um, this is the columns to focus the electron beam. And then there are all kinds of detectors also. Um, so, so this is another zoom in, different angles. Um, you have the electron beam column and you also have the uh, focus ion beam column. Um, and then there are detectors, but I, I cannot go into the details just to show you. So these are just some, you can develop all kinds of features, very, very fine features using uh, electron beam lithography, like here, an example, you see all these arrays of structures. They're uh, 200 nanometers apart, but each structure is only like uh, about tens of nanometer uh, in dimension. And also you can very precisely um, make things. And here, this is just because uh, Kavli Nanoscience Institute is our nanofabrication uh, center. And so we, we, use, um, we use this nanofabrication techniques to write the, the, the logo on it. Uh, and this is just to show you all kinds of devices and structures that you can produce uh, with, with high resolution. Okay, um, now there's also focus ion beam uh, lithography. And focus ion beam, so if you use gallium ions, uh, it's much heavier than electrons. And so you can have much shorter de Broglie wavelengths. However, um, because it's much heavier, if you also have comparable energy as the electron energy, then you can cause a lot of damages to the surface. Sometimes you can take advantage of the damages if you want to really, you, like you want to remove a lot of material. So you have the material and then you have the gallium beam coming in and then you can actually cause, uh, you can sputter the atoms away and as well as some secondary electrons. Uh, so the gallium ion, um, the, the ion beam uh, actually, um, it hits the sample surface and then sputters more amount of materials away and leaves the surface in forms of, uh, you, can, you have secondary ions, neutral atoms or secondary electrons. And then you can have detectors collecting the information. Um, and so, so when you move your beam across, you can either 
high energy, you can remove a lot of materials. And if you use low energy, you can do imaging. Um, so, so, and also you can use the ions to deliberately deposit the ions into the material in the way you want. Um, so this is also uh, uh, the uh, schematics of how it works. You have the source of gallium coming out, and then you use electrostatic fields to focus the beam, and then uh, to control the beam, and you can scan the beam across, and then um, then you hit the sample, then there are different uh, collectors, the de detectors for the ions and electrons, secondary ions and secondary electrons. And so these are pictures showing uh, these features that you can imagine if I originally have a flat wafer, and now if I want to remove a lot of materials, then a uh, gallium ion beam is very useful. And then you can make all kinds of complicated structures. And these complicated structures are not, are not easily done by by um, photolithography. Um, so these three-dimensional structures are much easier to be done by focus ion beam or, or, um, or electron beam. And if you compare focus ion beam and electron beam, um, they have similarities and differences. Um, but gallium ion beam um, usually inherently is destructive to the specimen. And so if you use high energy, you can remove a lot of materials. Um, uh, you can implant the ions uh, to, into the sample by a few nanometers. And so it's, it's very different. And your surface often becomes amorphous. So because you really damage the surface um, because these ions are heavy, but they have been used. Um, you can do machine, basically you can remove materials. So it's very effective. Uh, and you can also have, you can dope the material with, um, uh, or you can actually um, um, do maskless implantations of ions. But, um, if you use a much lower beam current, then you can do imaging, and the imaging resolution is similar to, to electron scanning electron microscopy. But, but um, uh, gallium ion beam has additional advantages. It has secondary electrons, secondary ions being scattered off. So, so you can actually get additional information uh, compared with an uh, electron beam. For instance, um, like this is a picture showing that. Um, a, a sample that has different grains and their grain boundaries, and the grain boundaries actually can be detected by the focus ion beam, uh, gallium focus ion beam. But somewhere in the middle, I said gallium ion beams can cause damages and electron beam, um, uh, um, electron beam has more diffraction, so the resolution may not be as good. And so it's, it's like in the real world, nothing is perfect. Uh, so in the case of, um, uh, you can you can try to compromise doing helium or neon focus ion beam because these are lighter weight than gallium, so they won't cause as much damage, and they are also much heavier than electrons, so they have much better resolution. So then it depends on what you want to do. Again, you can use um, a helium beam to sorry to um, you can create helium beam I mentioned earlier. Uh, you have helium gas and you have a high voltage. And so the high voltage takes electrons away from the helium uh, uh, and then helium atoms be becomes ions. And then you can have a negative voltage here to extract uh, positive ions and then accelerate it. And so it becomes high energy. Uh, and then you can, you can arrange the optics and then hit the sample, then you have electrons or um, ions com uh, electrons coming out and you can detect a signal. So this is the, um, the image of what the helium ions uh, actually look like, um, the, the helium probe. Uh, really, it's only a few angstroms, so it has very high resolution. So this is a, a picture schematically showing that if you have electron beam, uh, the Broglie wavelength is longer, so you have larger diffraction, so the re resolution is a little less, uh, and you have um, helium or ne neon ion beam then because the masses are um, bigger than electrons, so the diffraction is smaller. And you can, you can actually have good resolution without causing a lot of damages. And so this is a real example of a real instrument of helium neon ion beam system. Uh, this system cost almost two million US dollars. Uh, we have one at Caltech uh, to, to make the structures. And this is what, um, what it looks like uh, when you look at all the connections outside. And then these, this is the computer screen of controlling all these different processes. This system contains both gallium beam and helium ion, uh, focus ion beam. And so this is a picture showing uh, the, the helium neon ion beam is coming from the top and the gallium ion beam is coming from the side. So you have all three beams. That means you can decide what you want to do. If you want to remove a lot of materials, you use gallium beam. And you, if you want very fine resolution, low damages, then you use helium neon ion beam. So here are pictures showing that um, 
we can use this three beam combinations to make very, very fine structures. So here you, here you take, you have a substrate, you remove a lot of materials here. So this part you use gallium beam. But then when you have these very, very fine structures, then you use helium or neon ion beam to create very, very fine structures. And these fines, and this is another picture showing that uh, using uh, uh, helium um, techniques to develop uh, an antenna. And then this is a picture taken with, tra sorry, transmission electron microscopy I'm showing. You can see atoms. Th this scale is only two nanometers and you can actually see atoms. Uh, this is yet another very fine structure being developed using helium neon ion beam. And these are additional examples like a surface. You have some chromium sample that has different grains and then you can see the, the, the structure. Uh, and this is um, an, another device that you make. Um, uh, and this is, if you zoom in, that's gold on some kind of a silicon surface is uh, porous and you can see the features. So these are imagings um, and these are uh, tiny structures, uh, a fine structure, uh, it's like an antenna um, a structure that you create. And these are single atom uh, layer. I mean, uh, these are graphene. This is graphene and you develop into tiny, tiny structures using helium beam because helium beam doesn't cause a lot of damage and graphene is only one atomic layer of carbon. If you're not careful, you can cause a lot of damage. Uh, this is graphene on a substrate. And so you see, you can see the, the feature here, you have a, a graphene layer and here you do not, you remove the graphene. So you can see that it, um, it can, these are used for very interesting devices. And again, these are other structures. You can see that how sharp down here, you can have a tiny gap. And all of these are um, used using helium neon and gallium combined ion beams. So those are for inorganic structures. If you want to image or you want to uh, make structures, but what about organic materials? Organic materials, you cannot do it as the way I just described to you. So, so one way is, is called soft lithography. So what you do, you, you first use hard lithography that I have just described to create some structures. Then you put some polymer on top of it and you put some polymer on top of it. And then when the polymer is cured, hardened, uh, you can peel it off. So you can create a structure with hard techniques and now you have a, a polymer that's replicating this, the structure you just created uh, as a negative. And then you can then press this, neg uh, this uh, polymer on some kind of organic ink. And this organic ink, uh, then you press it on and you then um, pick up the, the ink uh, using the polymer. And then the, you can then press the material onto gold, let's say gold surface, and the material can adhere to it. So this is like, a, this is called a stamping process. Um, and so microscopically you're de transferring the organic material into a gold surface with a pattern that you pre-designed. So that's for soft uh, things. So I just mentioned to you all these are top-down processes, but they are also bottom-up processes. So you can have uh, atomic scale fabrication, for instance, using uh, atomically sharp scanning tunneling microscopy. Uh, I will explain scanning tunneling microscopy a little bit in, in a moment. And so this is like what people have demonstrated. You can put individual, all of these are individual atoms of cobalt on top of gold. Uh, and you can put it into this uh, ellipse, elliptical shape. And, and so, so then you, these, this is a false color topography. You can image it, you image single atoms, but you also see some wavy pictures and that's because quantum mechanically, um, the electronic wave functions are also waves and it's almost like you're seeing a wavy picture. Uh, okay, and then if you do spectroscopy, you, you have a constant bias conductance. Then, then you see that these cobalt then have a, or certain bias voltage has very, very sharp um, point, uh, sharp conductance in the, correlating with the atomic positions. Now you, you know, people play a trick, so they call this quantum corral. Now they play a trick, they put, um, because you know every ellipse has two cosi, right? Uh, you have two foci. So they put one extra atom in one of the foci and then image the conductance. So it turns out that um, even though you only have one atom at this foci, but because of the property of, of uh, ellipt, uh, elliptical uh, structure, all of the electron waves, um, you have electrons on the surface. And so, so the electron waves are going to be scattering back to another uh, 
another focus point. So even if you don't have an electron, you are effectively seeing uh, this other uh, focal point. Uh, similarly here, you have a, a focus point here. There's no focus at point atom there, but then um, quantum mechanically uh, electron waves, this is a pro proof of quantum mechanics, uh, then you see the electron waves actually get refocused onto this other point. So this is called quantum mirage. Uh, and then you, you also see other patterns because this is like a resonator. And so you have electron waves that are resonating. Um, that's a bottom-up uh, approach. You can do things atom by atom. But there are also other ways. You can also use uh, other scanning probe techniques like, a, um, like an atomic force microscope, which I will also describe a little bit in a moment. Um, so, so what you can do is you can use a very sharp tip. And this sharp tip, you can process on a substrate. And so you can either deliver energy by scraping things and then create a pattern that you want. Uh, but of course, this is uh, for, for um, inorganic systems. Uh, or you can deliver material. You can actually use so-called dip pin lithography, nanolithography. That is, you take a sharp tip and dip it into some kind of organic molecules, and then you can write it. So it's like a, a, a water fountain pen. Uh, so we can write the structures. Uh, they transfer the organic molecules to, to the surface of, of a substrate. So there are these different ways of doing it. Um, and there's another way, using DNA, actually. Um, it's called DNA nanotechnology. It's also a bottom-up technique. Uh, so what it is is that you, you, you actually take advantage of special properties of uh, uh, um, um, nucleic acid uh, related to DNA structures. Um, and, and that's the, the, the reason is that DNAs, you can describe them, separate them into um, uh, different components of um, I am not going to say the chemical names of these, I mean the name of these, but then they're effectively, you have four different bases, A, C, G, T, uh, four kinds of bases. And the interesting thing is um, uh, A can only bind to T and C can only bind to G. And therefore, if you design your DNA structures, put them in some special sequence and then put another structure, so you have you, you can have one structure, a strand of DNA, and you have the, the code here. And you have another strand, and you design them in such a way that, that, um, that they can, these two strands can bind. So you can design a structure like this, for instance. And these, um, the, these bases are very small. So generally you can make very stru small structures by pre-designing how you are arranging your ACGT um, uh, basis. So these are examples uh, the first done uh, at Caltech by, uh, by uh, Paul Rothmund. Uh, what he did was he took a long, very long DNA and, and then um, he then folded the DNA. So it's like, it's called origami. Origami, in, I think uh, in, in Chinese should be zhe uh, how you actually fold paper. So it's DNA origami, and he basically um, designed the DNA sequences, and then he can fold it in whatever way he wants. Uh, so he can use his computer to first design it, and these are the computer designed, and these are real what he processes, uh, processed. <laughs> so he was doing like a, a smiling face. Um, and then you can also design other, other um, DNA molecules to make them as staples. So there are staples you can uh, uh, make sure that your structures don't fall apart when you fold them together. And again, you use this ATCG kind of um, uh, pairing, base pairing rules. So you can make structures and these structures can be very small uh, because of the basic dimensions. There's, uh, you can have six nanometer per pixel and two nanometer thick per stack. So you can make um, 2D to 3D, so two dimensional to three dimensional structures. Um, so, so that's another DNA technology, and that's called a bottom-up approach. Okay, so we just talked about nanolithography and nano Im nanoscale imaging approaches, both for inorganic and organic, and bottom-up as well as top-down. So um, now, usually you want to study properties of these small structures. So in addition to imaging, you want to study spectroscopy, for instance, or other properties. So how do you do that? Well, you have to make instruments that are compatible with these small structures. So the, um, 
especially if you want to look at locally, very local nanostructures. And so these are called um, the, the instrumentation that you can develop is called scanning probe microscopy. The first scanning probe microscopy is a scanning terminal microscopy. And this also won the Nobel Prize in 1986. It was first developed in 1981. Remember Feynman made his uh, speech 1959 in December, so almost 1960. So it took 20 something years to realize this. Um, but uh, so this was quickly uh, won the Nobel Prize. And so STM, what's STM? It combines quantum tunneling concept with atomic scale piezoelectric control. Piezoelectric is the type of material that you can apply voltage to it and then it will have mechanical motion to very, very high precision. So you combine those two uh, things, quantum tunneling and, and atomic scale piezoelectric control, you can reach, it becomes a revolutionary spatial um, resolution for atomic scale imaging and spectroscopy that you can use. And then um, the invention of STM further inspired other um, developments of scanning probe microscopy, that's scanning um, like, like uh, atomic force microscopy and various other types of microscopy. And it plays an essential role to the revolutionary of um, nanoscience and technology. And so categories of scanning probe microscopy, including tunneling microscopy, that's the original type. There are many other types, which I won't have time to go through. I will just tell you the most important thing, scanning tunneling microscopy, and then the force microscopy, uh, including atomic force microscopy and other types of force microscopy. Again, I will only tell you one type. Um, and then you can also have field microscopy, that is uh, you bring to near field, you can look at optical properties. So here you look at electrical properties using electric, uh, scanning tunneling, uh, force properties um, like mechanical or other properties using atomic force microscopy, and you can have optical properties down to small scale, and then you can have hybrid. You can put AFM and, and light together becomes a scattering scanning nano, uh, near field optical microscopy, or you can put STM together with light. So they just use your imagination once you understand the physical principles. So how does STM work? Uh, th this is an STM image. Th this is a real atomic imaging uh, that, that we took from our homemade scanning tunnel microscope. Uh, and this is a, a, a two-dimensional superconductor surface. Uh, it's called Niobium disalinide. Uh, so how does that work? Uh, the way it works is, quantum mechanics, um, you, you bring a tip very, very close to the surface of the sample. And then on the surface of the sample, you have different height variations of your atoms. And so when the tip is very, very close, actually um, electrons can tunnel from the tip to the sample. And similarly, you can also have a bias voltage that can tunnel from the sample to the tip as well. Um, but the tip to the sample can give you a very high resolution. And and, but then the, the amount of electrons that can, the probability of the electrons can tunnel through the tunneling current will be very sensitive to how, how far apart your tip is from the sample. And so if you fix the, the, the tunneling current using a feedback electronical, uh, electrical design, then the position of the tip will be, uh, will be following the surface modulation uh, of these atoms. And therefore that's how you can do imaging. So this, this is when you get um, topography, uh, three-dimensional topography. So you can scan your tip, uh, scan along x, y direction, and then you can have the modulations along the z direction. It's a three-dimensional uh, process. Or you can also add a biased voltage. And, and so what, what it is, is you bring this atomically sharp tip, attach it to piezoelectric materials. So the piezoelectric materials, you apply biased voltage to it, it can give you a very fine motion. Um, so you can do three-dimensional imaging, or if you disable your feedback process, and then you can uh, just fix the position of the tip and tunnel through the sample and add a bias voltage between the tip and the sample. And that way you can measure the, the tunneling current, uh, the de uh, tunneling current versus voltage or the def derivative of the tunneling current versus voltage. And that gives you spectroscopy. Um, so that can give you a lot of physics information. But to do it right, if you have such a sensitive system, you must make sure you have very good vibration isolation uh, and you must have very good positioning system. And also you have to make sure you have very low noise electronic um, systems. 
And also you need computer automation because you're going to acquire so much data and you need a good software to control and to analyze data. And also if you want to go to low temperatures, you have to make sure all of your components have comparable thermal properties. Otherwise, if your thermal contraction and expansion coefficients are different for your different components, then the system will fail when it goes to low temperatures. So those are the things you need to know. And so what do you get the tunneling current? So this is the only equation I'm going to show uh, because I know we have a lot of high school students. But this, well, this tunneling current is dependent on, it depends on the uh, conducting properties of the tip. So it's the conducting properties in this case is called density of states of the tip. So the tip can be at a bias voltage um, and your electrons have some energy E. Uh, and also your sample has um, information, uh, also has density of states, um, that's an, um, an energy E. And then uh, you, have an you have a little gap in between. So quantum mechanically, there's a tunneling matrix that's involved. And so this process is similar to a one-dimensional um, tunnel junction from normal metal with an insulating or vacuum gap to, an, to an, another normal metal. Um, you can think of it that way. And so if you know your tip very well, then this information will give you, uh, th this tunneling current will give you very precise information about the, the sample, density of states of the sample. So that's the idea. And so these are, for instance, showing you, this is the surface of a piece of graphite that we took using our STM, and you can see these atoms variations. And this is a tunneling spectroscopy into a, uh, a super high temperature superconductor. Um, and, and there are two, two high temperature superconductors here, uh, and they have, so this is tunneling conductance versus the bias voltage, and it shows very, very classic um, uh, tunneling peaks for a superconductor, which I cannot elaborate, but just to let you know, you can get extremely important information from this kind of study. Okay, and then you also have a um, scanning force microscopy. Um, after scanning tunneling microscopy was developed, scanning force microscopy was the next thing that was developed. Um, and there are typically two kinds of modes. So, so you have a cantilever that's flexible. And then this cantilever can be pressed again on, on the surface of the sample. So if your sample has some features, ups and downs, um, then your cantilever, when it scans across the surface, will have different deflection. And so, so you, this will be the contact force mode. And so you use a, you use a cantilever um, to detect that. And, or you can have a non-contact mode uh, to detect, detect the gradient of the force. Um, so there, 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 and there are different ways of detecting the, the amount of deflection. So the most typical, um, you can do um, uh, capacitance detection, tunneling detection, laser beam deflection, or optical inter interferometry. I will only mention one, the most typical one, laser beam deflection. So what it is is that, okay, I put, I, this is my cantilever and this is a sample, this is a side view. Um, so when I scan this, um, scan this tip across the sample, and if the sample has height variation, then you have different, so this uh, cantilever will move up and down. And when it moves up and down, you have a mirror here. So the mirror will be moving up and down. And if you have a laser focusing on the mirror, then, then your position of the, the light will be changing when you're moving your tip up and down. Um, and so from that, you use the deflection beam position to position sensitive detection of the light, and you know how much um, the cantilever has moved. So, so this is again another three-dimensional picture to show you. I just show you the side view. Uh, you have a cantilever and you have a laser beam coming down and the, you, have a, uh, you have a detector, uh, a position sensitive detector to detect where the light got deflected and you can convert that information to the height. Uh, and then you also have the X or Y position. And this is a real, this, this thing can be done at room temperature or you can cool it down, you can go to vacuum or so if you want. Um, but this is typically very um, uh, typical commercial atomic force microscope. And so what you can do is that um, compare with AFM versus SEM. Um, SEM, it, it, scanning electron microscopy cannot truly give you the three-dimensional information. You just see something as a two-dimensional projection. But atomic force microscope can give you a three-dimension. Um, oh, by the way, so atomic force microscope, you can say, well, STM can do that too. But STM can only study on a conducting surface. If your material is not, uh, if your sample is not conducting, then you cannot use STM. 
and then you have to change to AFM if you want to do it three-dimensional imaging. Um, and also, uh, you don't need to do very special surface treatment, unlike if you do scanning electron microscopy, you have to clean your surface and do all kinds of things in advance. And also, you can do it even in ambient environment or liquid, but with scanning electron microscopy, you need extremely high vacuum. But the disadvantage is that um, it's also a slow process, and then also the field of view you can scan is limited. And also, um, if, if you have very dramatic variations or very sharp features, then you won't be able to detect. So again, if you know the principles of how everything works, you can design things to what you want. And then you can also add, you can consider light. There are very interesting light properties you want to study light, but when you know light, usually the wavelength is very long, like visible light, you have several hundred nanometers in wavelengths. And so how do you go to nanoscale resolution? And the trick is that you go to near field, where you bring an optical, uh, let's say, fiber to very close to the sample. Actually, near field can give you a resolution much better, uh, like one order of magnitude better than the far field resolution. Far field resolution, you were dictated by the wavelengths. Uh, and in near field, you are at least one order of magnitude better. Um, and why do we want optical properties? Because there are many, many important things related to optical properties of devices and materials. And you can study dielectric constant, absorption coefficient, and conductivity by doing frequency dependent optical studies. Um, but, but still, Near field is not enough to give you truly nanoscale resolution. And so there is another trick, and this was developed uh, a very nice concept. You actually combine an atomic force microscope with a very, very sharp tip, and you shine light on it. Then this sharp tip will be illuminated by light. And so becoming like when you scatter light, interact with light, it will become a very sharp point of light. Um, and so, so then you can analyze the signal that comes out of this um, this far field light becoming near field light with very high resolution, and then you detect a signal. And, um, and this is light, and this is detection. Uh, when you detect a signal, and you can analyze the signal to, to extract information for this very local features. And this actually has been commercialized, although it's ex extremely expensive. And you can have many different wavelengths, and still you have resolution as good as several nanometers using this idea. Or you can also, instead of an uh, AFM tip, you can use an STM tip, and you can shine light on it. And then in this case, then you actually study the, you can use light to pump your material, and some materials are light sensitive, and then the, there will be electronic excitations, and you can pick it up from STM. Uh, you can have different modes of this excitation, or you can use um, some materials when you inject electrons, it can, it, it can actually, uh, emit photons. So you can also use a current pump and light probe kind of techniques. And so these actually also have been explored by many people. Uh, you can go to terahertz. Um, you can combine it with syn synchrotron X-ray. You can also do um, uh, in optical wavelengths. Um, and, and also you can, you can also have uh, STM induced light emission. And so these are, uh, I, I cannot going into great details, but, but um, this field has been evolving very nicely. And so you can pick up all kinds of information at nanoscale.